Get to know your guest laws. All right, this is um, the 2012 version of Get to know your guest laws. Um, I've done another video, which is uh, the same title, and that's just me explaining some um, things on paper. This is basically a this is a presentation explaining how it works in a bit more detail and where they where the guest laws actually come from. So we're going to touch on two things here. This is chapter 21 in your textbook of Heinemann. So um, that's where this is, information comes from. And we're going to look at, first of all, how gases behave, because um, obviously this unit is about the atmosphere, uh, or this part of the unit is about the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is made up of mainly gases. So we're going to look at how gases behave, and then we're going to look at Charles, Boyle's, and Avogadro's laws in terms of um, calculating things with gases. So before we get into it, we're going to, I'm going to tell you this is broken down into two sections. The first section, the first video, is on how gases behave, and the second one is to do with the um, different laws and calculations. So let's get stuck straight into it and have a look at how gases behave. Gases behave in this way. The properties of gases in general, um, this is what gases are like. Gases have a low density. It means that their particles are spread out. Obviously, we've done solids, liquids, and gases. Solids are compact really close together. Liquids a bit further around with a bit of movement, and gases are free to move completely, and they're far apart. Because they have a low density, because of the space between the molecules, they can be easily compressed. Okay, So because we have a lot of space between these two molecules, what we can do is exert a force on the top here, or push, um, cover up this and push it down, and we can compress these gases. This is the only state of matter which can be compressed. So it's a very important gas behavior or property of gases that they can be compressed. Gases also spread to fill a space. They will fill the complete volume of a container that they are in. While solids have a set shape, they don't, they don't move, all right? If you have a solid, it doesn't um, move at all. If you have a liquid, it will move to fill the container that it's in, okay? Um, it will fill the shape of the container that's in, but what gases will do is fill the entire thing. Then they can do this because they're constantly moving around and they have very little um, force between each other. Okay, the the kinetic energy that the um, molecules have, the moving energy, the amount of energy that they have moving around, is far greater than the force between the two molecules um, of a gas. So they constantly are spreading around, they're constantly moving and they can spread to fill a space, okay? They mix together rapidly, okay? If we have two gases, we'll constantly, because they're in constant motion, and because they spread out to fill a space, they'll, like, as soon as they are opened, if you have two containers, for instance, as soon as you open them, because they'll spread out and fill the space that they're in, they'll mix as well, so they're very quick to mix around together. Whereas if you have liquids, okay, liquids take a bit more time to mix because they're not moving as fast. And obviously solids, they don't really mix together at all, really, unless you really force it, smash it together. Even then they're not mixing, they're just touching. Whereas gases can constantly be moving around and therefore mix together very rapidly. They're in constant motion, as I said before. Um, they're not still. Solids are vibrating unless they're at zero degrees Kelvin. Um, solids are just vibrating. Liquids have a bit of motion in them. They can, okay, the particles are moving around, whereas um, our gases are constantly moving around. What we also they also do is they exert a pressure. Okay, gases have a, a, they exert a pressure onto the things around them. I'm going to focus on pressure for the next couple of slides as well. So um, this pressure thing, ignore it for a little bit. We'll look at these and look at what these can be used to explain. Okay. Why does a helium balloon float? Okay, or why do some balloons, why don't they just fall to the ground and smash? Why do things that have gases in them float? It's because of their low density. It's because they have very few particles, therefore they have a very um, small mass in terms of a, um, in volume, a very small volume to mass ratio because of their low density. Why can you, um, why can you inflate a tire? Okay, inflating a tire, say it has a certain amount in there, right? What's happening is you have a lot of, not many particles there. Inflating the tire, what you do is you're constantly putting these um, more particles in there and compressing the gas that's in there. That's not a very good explanation of easily compressed. We won't worry about that. 
The idea of um, spreading to fill a space, what that does in terms of um, someone has a gas tap on in the science lab, you can smell that. Okay, That's an idea that the gases are spreading to fill that space. They're coming out of the gas tap at the back of the room and the teacher at the front can still smell that gas because they're constantly spreading. They mix rapidly together. Um, an idea of that is with your um, hydrogen and oxygen. Um, if you fill a balloon with hydrogen, okay, for instance, we have a um, reaction between magnesium and hydrochloric acid, it gives us hydrogen. If we collect that hydrogen, all right, and we set that balloon on fire, what will happen is that those gases will mix really rapidly together and they'll um, form a massive explosion. And that's an example of how they mix rapidly together. They're in constant motion, spread to fill a space, it's the same type of thing really. The fact that they're constantly moving out and they're spreading to um, fill a space. So there's some examples of how these gas behaviours can be seen. Um, we'll look at exert pressure. What does exert pressure mean? So let's have a look at the next slide and look at what exert pressure means. Exerting pressures means that the force, um, the molecules, there's a force being emitted by them. Because they're constantly moving around, they're hitting the sides of the container, Okay, this exerts a force and this is known as pressure. So pressure is caused by the molecules hitting the side of a container. It's measured in a thing called pascals, which is PA. Okay, so that's, that's the standard unit or, um, for uh, pressure. So exerting pressure means that they are hitting the sides of the container and therefore it's creating a force. The force is greatest when you have a lot of things hitting the side of a container. I've got two examples here. I've got one with um, four particles in a certain volume, and here I've got one with six particles. This smaller one here will have a less force or less pressure than this one here. Let's say, for instance, if we have this one has a pressure of two kilopascals. Um, K pascals means a thousand pascals, so this is two thousand pascals. This one will have a larger force. For instance, I might have four kilopascals. Okay, so say we have this idea here. If we mix these two gases together, okay, what we have is a total pressure when they're mixed together of six kilopascals. This is because if you add in these two, these particles, the pink particles to the orange particles, we get a total pressure. These individual gases they're known as the partial, partial pressure. Okay? The partial pressure is the force of one component of a mixture of gases. So in terms of this, the partial pressure of the pink gas will be 2 kilopascals, and the partial pressure of the orange gas, gas will be 4 kilopascals. So you get the idea where we have um, partial pressures. When we add them together, we get the overall pressure. Under here, I've got um, some examples of gases in the atmosphere. Okay, Gases in the atmosphere, don't, um, obviously the atmosphere is a mixture of gases. It's a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and other gases. Obviously a bit of carbon dioxide in there, a bit of helium thrown in there for good measure as well. So we've got a partial pressure for our normal atmosphere is 80 kilopascals for nitrogen. The partial pressure of oxygen is 20 kilopascals. The partial pressure for argon is 1 kilopascal. Okay, and all the other gases, they add up to a partial pressure of 0.31. What will the total partial pressure, sorry, what will be the total pressure of our atmosphere? What will our total pressure of air be? If we have a, just a general air, I want you to think about it and get an answer in your head for what the total pressure will be. And then I'm going to give it to you. Okay, how to think about it? If we want the partial pressure of this is 80, this one's 20, this one's 1, this one's 0.31. All we need to do is add up the entire lot of gases and we'll work out the total pressure of our atmosphere. And if you add them together, you get 101.31 kilopascals. This is the pressure of air. This is atmospheric pressure. In general, at ground level and at the standard laboratory conditions, this is the pressure that air has. 101.31 kilopascals. We can change the pressure of a certain gas, all right? There's two ways we can do that. Well, there's a few ways, actually, but these are the two that I'm going to deal with at the moment. Generally, to increase the pressure, what you want to do is increase the amount of times a 
particle hits the side of the container. We can do that in two ways. One is with temperature. If we increase the temperature of a gas, what that's going to mean is that the gas is going to be moving quicker. That means it's going to hit the side of the container more often if it's moving quicker. So therefore, increasing the pressure, sorry, so increasing the temperature is going to increase the pressure that we have of a gas. And this, this is um, well known because if um, what you can do, no, what you can't do, or what um, if anyone's heated a can, a closed can, they'll notice that the pressure increases so much so that it might explode. So if you are increasing the temperature of a closed con container, what you're going to have is an increase in pressure and after a while it will explode. So obviously increasing the temperature is going to increase the pressure. Okay, don't do that at home. Um, it's not safe at all. Um, moving on. What we can also do is we can decrease the volume. Okay, decreasing the volume in this is going to make this box smaller. Making the box smaller is going to mean we have a greater concentration of gas in a certain area. Okay, so these two things are going to increase the pressure. Decreasing the volume is going to mean we have less of this blue area, so therefore they're going to hit the sides more often. Okay, if anyone's played a game called Jez Ball, um, you'll understand that the smaller the um, area of um, the space you have, the more often that the balls will hit the sides of the container. If you haven't done that, please Google Jez Ball. It's a brilliant game. Um, it was, yeah, good game, Jez Ball. Have a look at it. And that will give you an idea of why you increase um, the volume if you, sorry, decrease the volume, you increase the pressure. Increase in concentration means you have more particles there, so therefore you have an increase in pressure as well. So this explains it here where you have from um, only four particles to 10 particles, you have more particles there, and so they're more likely to hit the sides of the container, so therefore you're going to increase the pressure. So all these things have a, to do with pressure. How is pressure measured? That's the next part of our um, thing. So let's go on to the next slide and have a look. The units, as I said before, um, units for um, pressure is called pascals, where you have a force over a certain amount of area. Pascals is a measure of newtons per square metre. Okay? A newton is a measure of force, and obviously a square metre is a measure of area, so we have the newtons per square metre. There's other ways of measuring um, pressure, though. There's measuring pressure in atmospheres. At ground level, we have a pressure of one atmosphere. There's also millimetres of mercury, the old school, old school scale of measuring um, pressure, where um, if you have a tube of mercury, atmospheric pressure would have pushed mercury up by 760 millimetres, and that's a scale of um, pressure. Okay, I'll be back in two seconds. Just going to let my dog out. All right, I'm back. Another way of measuring pressure is to do with um, the bar, the PA, and the KPA. PA is pascals, all right, and KPA is kilopascals. Bar is a measure that's based upon the pascal scale, and it's basically megapascals. I know, a little bit less than megapascals. Anyway, this is how we convert between them, though. One atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury, it's 1.03013 bar, it's 1.013 times 10 to the power of 5 pascals, and it's 101.3 kilopascals. Okay? We will need to be able to convert between these um, different units. Okay? And that's what these, this part here is about. All right? From 101.3 kilopascals is one atmosphere. The most in general, you're going to really convert between atmosphere and kilopascals. Sometimes you might get millimetres of mercury. Very rarely we use bar, and very rarely we use pascals. Main thing is converting between atmosphere and kilopascals, or millimetres of mercury and kilopascals. Let's just have a look at it, though. If one atmosphere is 101.3 kilopascals, half an atmosphere is going to be half of this. So therefore, it's 56.65 kilopascals. That should make sense. Okay, converting between 
atmosphere and kilopascals, we look at the ratio between them. Okay, going from pKa down to bar. All right, if you're going from pKa to bar, what you'll notice is you're going dividing it by 100. So if you have 90 um, kPa, sorry, not pKa, let's say kPa anyway. The number of bar you're going to have is divided by 100, means you're going to have 0.9 bar pressure. It's going to get a bit harder when you work out your millimeters of mercury because you've got a weird number here and a weird number here of conversions. The easiest way to do it is to divide by what you have and multiply what you're going to. Okay, so in terms of this, 500, to get from 500 to kPa, we're going to divide by what we have, so divide it by 760, and then multiply it by 101.3. And that's going to be able to, how you convert between these two things. So if you do 500 divided by 760, then multiply it by this, you get 100 and, sorry, 84.1 kilopascals. You're going to need to be able to convert between these, and there's a few questions in the textbook. It's question 5, 6, and 7 is how you convert between the different types of units of pressure. So I want you to go away and do these questions as a minimum. Okay, and this really involves conversions of um, conversion between different types of pressures because you need to know them to have a convert between them. This is part two, so I'm going to pause the podcast now and I'm going to start a new video and we'll go into this in a second.